right, welcome back everyone. In this video, we're going to be looking at module 19. Um, so if you want to follow along with the modules, you can find them in D2L, you can pull up the PowerPoint. Or if you want to follow along in the book, it's found on page 234 um, for the first piece of this. Uh, so th this next little series of modules is actually going to be looking at the how we learn material. Uh, so basic learning is going to be what we're looking at today. Specifically, classical conditioning is going to be kind of the, the, the main thing that we're going to be focusing on. Um, so conditioning is, it, there's two different forms of conditioning. Today we're going to be looking at classical conditioning. In the next video, we'll be looking at operant conditioning, um, which these oftentimes can get confused by a lot of people. Uh, in order to basically kind of help with that confusion, I've actually, or to reduce that confusion, I guess I don't want to help you get more confused. Um, I included some videos in this week's uh, material. You can find them on, and it, but it really does go through relatively quickly and shows a comparison of um, of classical conditioning versus operant conditioning. So that way you can, uh, if you're kind of like, wait, which one was which? You can look at these videos and it'll, it'll break it down for you. But um, hopefully it'll, you'll have a pretty clear understanding by the time we're all done with today's lecture, at least on the classical conditioning side of things. Okay. So yeah, follow along, PowerPoint, book, just watch the video, however you like to do it. And um, beyond that, just remember to do the quizzes, right? There's a quiz for the, for the module and the book, and then also the quiz for the lecture. Uh, same format, four random facts as we go. Um, and I believe that's it. So let's get rolling. And always message me if you have questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's get going. We're going to start with slide two. That's, that's where the actual information begins. How do we learn? Part one. Um, learning is a process of acquiring through experience, new and relatively enduring information or behaviors. That seems pretty straightforward, and it really is as straightforward as it sounds. Essentially, learning is just the, the accumulation of, of knowledge and experience that happens over the lifetime. Okay, so everything that we do is a learning opportunity, whether that's um, you know, like like going outside and you, you get rained on or something like, oh, I should have done this or I check, check the weather or whatever. Um, that experience is a learning thing that might make you do something different. You know, what you're doing right now in this class with learning this new material, this is obviously a sign of learning, right? You're, you're gaining new knowledge that you can then apply to how you understand the world. And then potentially it can change how you uh, experience and perceive the world from here on out. Okay, so associative learning is learning that certain events occur together. The events may be two stimuli, as in classical conditioning, or a response and its consequences, as in operant conditioning. And that's going to be the main difference between these two things. The two stimuli are going to be things like, uh, we're going to look at Pavlov here in a second, but when, like, when we see lightning, if we see the lightning close, you might flinch in expectations of the thunder. Okay. The lightning is the, the flash of the lightning is a stimuli, and the boom of the thunder is a stimuli. Two different stimuli that we associate together. Okay. Uh, operant conditioning, and we're going to dig into this more in the next video, but an operant conditioning uh, is basically the, the idea of like you did something good and you got rewarded, or you did something bad and you got punished. That, that would be a kind of thing where, with operant conditioning where I, I do something in anticipation for the good thing that I will get from it, or I avoid something because I anticipate that if I were to do it, I would get punished for it. Okay. So classical conditioning is a simpler form of it. Um, you can find classical conditioning basically in every living thing. You can even classically condition in goldfish. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Okay. All right, slide two, how do we learn part two? Um, so stimulus is gonna be an event or situation that evokes a response, right? We learned about this, we learned about the senses, right? It's it's all of the things that are coming into our senses. It stimulates our senses in some way. Our senses then transform that into a neuro uh, signal, an electrical impulse essentially, uh, that then travels through our nervous system to our brain where it is then interpreted to become a perception. So that stimulus is whatever that thing may be, right? The fact that you're watching this video is stimulating your eyes. The fact that you're listening to my voice is stimulating your ears, that's a stimulus, okay. Um, it could be a pinprick, it could, all those kinds of things, okay. Anything, basically, that causes your senses to react is a stimulus. Uh, conditioning 
is going to be the process of learning associations, which takes two main forms. Classical conditioning, where we associate stimuli that we do not control and we automatically respond, exhibiting respondent behavior. Um, so the, the classical condition in this case, our response, if we see like lightning flash and we cringe because we're expecting the thunder, that cringe shows that we, are, we have been conditioned to react to the stimulus of the lightning and expectations of the stimulus of the thunder. Okay. Um, operant conditioning is where we associate a response, our behavior, and its consequence, producing operant behaviors, right? We, we, we want to do good in class because we want to get good grades. Um, you go to work every day because you want to get a paycheck at the end of the week. All those kinds of things are, are basically operant conditioning in action. Cognitive learning is the acquisition of mental information, whether by observing events, by watching others, or through language. So this is where we actually, you, you learn a process. Um, so it's more complex than the classical and operant conditioning. Okay. Um, observational learning is a form of cognitive learning that lets us learn from others' experience. I can observe somebody doing something and then mimic them or copy them. Monkey see, monkey do uh, is going to be cognitive learning. Okay. Um, so this will incorporate the pretty much all the levels of, 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 of learning from like anything that I can talk about. If I can tell you a story, what you're learning in this class right now in this video lecture is, is a form of cognitive learning. It's information that you're taking in for future reference, but it's specifically like information that you can actually like talk about, right? I'm not just reacting to the environment and I'm not just anticipating the results. It's something that I can actually pull forward. The idea like two plus two equals four is cognitive learning. Okay. You're, if you're assuming you're able to read, that's cognitive learning. Okay. Um, four, uh, slide four, class conditioning part one. Ivan Pavlov's early 20th century experiments are psychology's most famous research. We talked a little bit about Pavlov in the very first chapters uh, or modules of this, of this uh, class. Ivan Pavlov was a, a Nobel... He actually won a Nobel Prize for his work in biology. He was not a psychologist, um, but he stumbled upon classical conditioning in his research. Essentially, what the experiment that he became famous for, outside of what he won for the Nobel Prize, um, he was measuring this. He was measuring the, the digestive systems of dogs uh, in in his biology studies. That was what he was focusing on. One of the experiments he was doing is he he actually uh, hooked up a test tube. He bypassed the dog's saliva glands to the mouth and made it go into a test tube. He would then provide the, the dogs with a stimulant, specifically uh, meat powder, which would cause the dogs to begin to salivate, and it would fill the, these little vials. And he was, he was measuring the amount of saliva that was produced in dogs uh, when they were eating, basically to, to try to better understand their, their digestive system. What he stumbled on <coughs> is that he had a specific assistant that always brought the food to the dogs. He would give the, this assistant would be the one who gave them meat powder. And what he noticed one day is that the assistant had a very distinct way of walking. I'm back. Hopefully, hopefully I didn't go too bad. Um, okay, so the assistant is, is walking. He has a distinctive way of walking. And one day, Pavlov noticed that as the assistant was approaching the dogs, they hadn't the dogs hadn't seen the assistant yet. They could just hear his footsteps. The dog began to salivate, and this made no sense initially because essentially there was no uh, stimulant that should be causing salivation. And so Pavlov, got, being the scientist and being curious at this, began to do research and studies on different ways that you could potentially teach a dog to salivate. Okay. From his work, basically we, have, we developed classical conditioning, type of learning in which one learns to link two or more stimuli and anticipate events, right? They, they begin to link the sound of the assistant's footsteps with the food that was coming, okay? And this actually gave birth to behaviorism. So behaviorism is psychology, this is their views. Psychology, one, should be an objective science that, two, studies behavior without reference to mental processes. They didn't give a rip what you were thinking. All they cared about was data in, data out. And that's essentially what, it was born from Pavlov's observations. So you could use behaviorism on working with animals, because I can't read what an animal was thinking at the moment. Um, you could do it on people, you could do it on all these things, right? Today, there's been some changes, right? We, we, you're going to find very few people who are just like hardcore behaviorists and really stick to this idea. Uh, most research psychologists today agree that one with one, right? Uh, psychology should be an objective science. 
but not with the second idea that studies behavior without reference to mental processes. The mental processes are an important part of understanding how we work in the world, right? Um, it may be subjective, but that's okay, right? Like it, but each person's experience is different, right? Each person's perceptions are different, but understanding the whys of those differences even can be very important in understanding humans. So, um, so pure behaviorism kind of has been rejected, but there's still a lot of it that it remains today. So on slide five, uh, you find an image of Pavlov's device, okay, that he worked with. You can see this also on page 237, if you're following along in the book instead of with the PowerPoints. Um, so this was his device for, for, for researching uh, saliva, right, to see how much a dog was producing. Uh, what he began to do with this was actually, he, he began to experiment with what kinds of things he could condition the dog to begin to salivate with. Um, so he would do things like, what he was famous for is like ringing a bell, um, and then giving the dog food and he'd ring the bell and he'd give the dog food. He'd ring the bell and give the dog food. And what he found is that after a few times of doing this, just ringing the bell would cause the dog's uh, biology to basically respond as if he were already eating the food. The digestive system would engage in everything because it is in anticipation for the sound of the bell ringing. He also found that he could do it with like vibrations. He could vibrate different parts of the dog and it would cause the dog to begin to salivate with like they could, you know, that, that stimulus could be connected to the food being given, um, all of those kinds of things. And that works exactly the same with us as it does with the dogs. And like I said, you can even classically condition, you know, goldfish and, and, and pretty much very simple creatures. Um, insects can even be classically conditioned uh, to some extent where you, you can train them essentially through using these methods. Okay, You're, it's limited, it's it's a limited thing. I cannot, uh, there are certain stimulus that are gonna be very difficult to associate together. Um, but if, if there's any kind of a potential relationship, it, it is relatively easy to do this with people and animals. Um, yeah, all right, slide six. I'll talk about that more in just a second. Slide six, so these are the different elements of classical conditioning, classical conditioning part three. Um, the neutral stimulus, or NS, in classical conditioning, uh, a stimulus that elicits no response before conditioning. The bell ringing, okay, uh, the, the light flashing for a lightning, um, that would be a neutral stimulus. There is no, there's no natural response to that given stimulus necessarily, okay? You hear it or whatever, but that's it. Um, get it this can also be like if you hear a phone ringing, okay, the phone ringing itself is a neutral stimulus, or a phone vibrating in your pocket is a neutral stimulus. It has no, initially, it has no meaning to you other than just the sound or vibration itself. Okay, neutral stimulus. Unconditioned response, or you are, in class conditioning is an unlearned, naturally occurring response, such as salivation with Pavlov's dogs, to an unconditioned stimulus, such as food in the mouth. The unconditioned stimulus, so you, you would have a natural response to that specific thing, right? I put food, if I put food in my mouth, I begin to salivate naturally because that's part of my, how my body reacts to food. I don't normally salivate to the sound of a bell ringing, right? Um, so unconditioned stimulus or US in class conditioning is a stimulus that unconditionally, naturally, and automatically triggers an unconditioned response. If I prick you with a pin, you're gonna pull back, right? That's a natural response. If I give you food and you put it in your mouth, you begin to salivate, natural response. Um, so yeah, and those are gonna, so the un, the unconditioned response and the unconditioned stimulus are directly tied to each other. Okay, slide seven, class conditioning part four, conditioned response or CR in classical conditioning, a learned response to a previously neutral but now conditioned stimulus. You begin to salivate at the sound of the bell ringing. Okay, if you were the dog. Um, you can also do this with people. Again, that exact same thing you can do with people, you can do this with yourself. It's actually kind of a fun experiment to do. Um, I'll, I'll give you some details on that in just a second when we get into the kind of the, the different levels of, of how we acquire this. Um, conditioned stimulus, or CS in classical conditioning, is an, an originally irrelevant stimulus that after association with an unconditioned stimulus comes to trigger a conditioned response. Okay. So the conditioned response is I begin to salivate at the conditioned stimulus, the bell ringing. Okay. Salivating is a natural thing for me to do, right? I do it with food, That'd be it. that would be the, the, um, 
the normal thing, right? The unconditioned uh, response and the unconditioned stimulus. It just is, it naturally is tied together. Once I associate that natural with this new stimulus, um, that's where these come into play. So for three decades, decades, Pavlov's research demonstrated associative learning, exploring five major conditioning processes, acquisition, extinction, spontaneous recovery, generalization, and discrimination. So slide eight talks about these things. So acquisition is the initial stage, right? This is where I'm giving you food and ringing a bell, okay? When one links a neutral stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus so that the neutral stimulus begins triggering the conditioned response. Uh, and this is where you can kind of do the experiment yourself, right? I'd recommend using, if you want to do this and see if it works on you and or your kids and or friends or whatever you want to do, there's literally, there's no harm in this version of it. Uh, you can take like powdered lemonade or something like that, something that makes you salivate really easily. Okay, sour candy is another good one. Uh, but something that triggers a, a strong response. Ring a bell or play a tone or whatever, right? And then put the powder in your mouth or the, the, the sour candy in your mouth. Get the response. Do that several times relatively close together. You know, take a 30 second break or a minute break and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again and then do it again. Do it three or four times, maybe five for some people. Um, and then try just giving yourself a stimulus. So in this case, you do like ring the bell, lick the lemonade. Ring the bell, lick the lemonade. Ring the bell, lick the lemonade. Ring the bell and see if you begin to salivate without the lemonade. Okay, if you do, you have, you, you have basically experienced this acquisition. You have acquired this conditioning to associate the bell ringing or the tone or whatever with the lemonade and you're having that natural response. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's a, at, at that point you have been conditioned classically to have this conditioned response to that stimuli. Extinction is the diminishing of a, of a conditioned response. So basically, if you keep ringing the bell and you don't reinforce it with the lemonade, eventually your brain's like, oh, the bell ringing has no effect on my cell. Like there's no reason to salivate at the bell ringing um, to make it go away. So it occurs in classical conditioning when an unconditioned stimulus does not follow conditioned stimulus. Initially, you might still salivate after a few times ringing the bell with no reinforcer, right? No, no stimulus. But eventually your brain figures it out. Spontaneous recovery is where there's a reappearance after a pause of an extinguished conditional conditioned response. You can see an image of this, like a little graph version of it, on uh, the next slide. So slide nine. You can also see it on page. Uh, whoops. You can see it on page two thirty eight if you're following along in the book. Okay. Um, so this is where you you you've acquired you've you know the acquisition has occurred to the neutral stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. Um, and then the extinction that happens with the conditioned stimulus, it kind of fails, right? You pause for a while, you ring the bell, and you have a reaction again. Okay, that's the spontaneous recovery. With the, with the spontaneous recovery, you, it, it, the extinction happens very quickly afterwards. And it generally, the pause, like the, the break there, it needs to be relatively close. Unless you are super conditioned, uh, the extinction might last a long time, and then suddenly... It, you can spontaneously recover it. But in the course of like an experiment where you're doing the lemonade kind of thing, um, it would go extinct pretty quickly. Okay. Okay. The other things you found, classical conditioning part six. And so basically if you're doing the experiment, do the lemonade until you begin to salivate without the lemonade. And then just keep ringing the bell occasionally until you stop salivating and you're unconditioned at that point. It's gone extinct. Okay. Um, generalization is the tendency once a response uh, has been conditioned for stimuli similar to the conditioned stimulus to elicit similar responses. Uh, this is where, like, so now it's not just this bell ringing. It is all bells ringing cause me to, to respond this way. Okay. Discrimination is the opposite of that, basically. The learned ability to distinguish between a conditioned stimulus, which predicts the unconditioned stimulus, and other irrelevant stimuli. So if you ring this tone of bell, you respond to it. A different tone of bell, no effect. Okay. We did this, uh, if, you, if you take these classes on, on campus, we actually do a lab portion. Um, and in that lab, you would actually, this is part of, part of what the, the, the experiment is, is this classical conditioning. Um, I, had a, I had a student who was like, I am unconditionable until he did the lab. And then he, uh, what we do, we use pictures actually instead of a bell. So we show a picture of a dog, a German Shepherd. And then you, you lick the lemonade 
and we do that a few times until you start to salivate just at the picture of the of the of the uh, of the dog of the German Shepherd. Then we show a picture of a bear and see if anything happens, right? Because the dog and a bear look kind of similar. The student of mine who who argued that he was completely unconditionable, basically, I could show any picture of animal for a pretty good chunk of time, and he would begin to salivate. So, um, fun stuff. Anyway, those are those parts there. I just realized I have not given you the random fact. So here's the first random fact. Because <laughs> as we're coming to the end of this, berries are simple fruits stemming from one flower. This means that pineapples, bananas, watermelons, pumpkins, and avocados are technically berries um, given that situation. So there you go. Weird fact about berries. It's not just a little blueberry or a little raspberry. It is. Uh, it, it can also be all these other things. Okay. All right, so generalizing versus discrimination. Hopefully that makes sense. Slide 11, generalization. Uh, Pavlov demonstrated generalization by attaching miniature vibrators to various parts of the dog's body. Um, with this, he, he was actually kind of trying to figure out uh, what parts of the dogs are more sensitive. The strongest response uh, was from the, the areas nearest the thigh. Um, so back on the back leg is where he actually got the strongest response overall. Um, Beyond that, the the basically the closer it was to the given area of the stimulation uh, of what he was trying to go for would be the more likely to respond. So in this case, for his dogs, he found that the, the back thigh was the most responsive of all the different parts of the body that he tried vibrating to get the response to. Um, so yeah, and this is again, this is going to be happening. Uh, I don't I don't know if I mentioned this, but this is going to be happening basically unconsciously. Um, that's one of the key things with classical conditioning is it takes no thought. Um, so it doesn't matter how much I think I'm not going to respond to this bell ringing. If I have been classically conditioning, I ring the bell, I will have a natural response to it. Okay, and that was one of the, that's one of the key aspects of classical conditioning. This is also why uh, if you get like food sickness, so you eat something and then you get sick right afterwards and you, you vomit it up, you're more than likely going to have a hard time re-eating a similar kind of food um, close to that time. When I was five years old, I, I ate a bowl of alphabet soup, uh, Campbell's alphabet soup, and I got the stomach flu directly after that, right? For 24 hours, I basically did not stop vomiting. Um, to this day, the smell, if somebody opens a can of, of alphabet soup, I basically have to leave the room because it just, the smell of it alone uh, just nauseates me. I have been classically conditioned to avoid that at pretty much all costs, right? Now, if I wanted to break that, if I wanted that to go extinct, I could technically sit down and probably force myself to eat a bowl or a couple of spoonfuls at least of alphabet soup. And if I did that a couple of times and I never got sick with that, um, then it would, it would go extinct. To me, it's just not worth it. I didn't really like alphabet soup all that much even when I was a kid, so not, not the biggest loss. Um, but this is actually a survival mechanism, right? If, if you're hunter-gatherer out in the woods, like Ice Age times, right? You're, hunt, you're hunting for your meat and you're, you're eating plants off the ground. If you eat something and it makes you sick, it, being conditioned to not eat that again can keep you alive. Okay, um, And that is why that, that association is generally one of the strongest and one of the fastest ones to be, be connected. If you get sick from something, you are very likely to have at least a nauseous response even to the presence potentially of that thing. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Second random fact. Kind of, kind of squeeze him in here. A man named Ronald McDonald robbed a Wendy's in 2005. <laughs> so yeah, Ronald McDonald is off again. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a random fact. There you go. Irony. Okay. Pavlov's legacy. Um, the consensus among psychologists is that classical conditioning is a basic form of learning, right? It involves very simple forms of, of memory. Um, and again, it doesn't actually take any kind of conscious thought, which is why pretty much every living thing uh, you can use classical conditioning with. Operant conditioning is a little more difficult to do with simpler life forms. You can, but it's challenging. Classical conditioning, not so, it's, it's actually quite easy. Okay. Um, why should we care that dogs can be conditioned to the sound of a tone? So many other responses to many other stimuli can be classically conditioned in many other organisms. Again, so if I'm trying to train something for some reason, this can be a very useful tool. Um, in, in, in it, it is limited 
and what you're capable of training it to with this, but it is possible. Okay, so Pavlov demonstrated how a learning process can be studied objectively, and that's actually one of the biggest things with this, was that before this, there really was no way of scientifically studying how we learn. Um, and so he, he's kind of on accident stumbled upon this, but it, it because of that, he was, he's been able to, uh, or we've been able to basically push psychology into this deeper into the realm of science and, and not just in the idea of speculation. So classical conditioning is a basic form of learning that applies to all species. Okay. Um, let's see. Applications of classical conditioning, part one. You can find, there's, they have a list of these on page 241, where they can, where some different things that they've used this for. Um, so Pavlov's principles are used to influence human health and well-being. Um, so you can, you can actually trigger areas of consciousness. You can help use this for motivation or demotivation, like if you're trying to remove something. Um, you can use this for uh, triggering emotions. So you can actually, you can be classically conditioned to have an emotional response to a given stimuli. Once you understand that, you can un you can basically make that reaction go extinct, uncondition yourself if you do it intentionally. Once you recognize that that's the case, so you're like in this situation, given this stimulus, I respond with this emotion. Um, and generally, if, if it's a negative emotion like anger or or like deep sadness or anxiety, like high stress or things like that, um, you can once you recognize it for what it is and, and what the stimulus is, you can uncondition it to where it no longer has that emotional reaction. You no longer have that emotional reaction to that given stimulus. Okay. Um, so this is something that they use in when working with people with PTSD, uh, specifically like veterans who, who their PTSD oftentimes is connected to like loud sounds and things like that. Um, once you recognize that, you can uncondition to some extent the emotional response, that fear response um, that oftentimes is connected to it, right? So you're bang and your body is like, has been conditioned because it's basically kept you alive to respond with fear, to react to the bang, which traditionally, if, you know, in your previous experience, if you're a veteran, was somebody trying to kill you or kill one of your friends. Um, and so you can basically, through conditioning, you can, you can uncondition somebody to, to not have an emotional response to those sounds which can be a big help, right? Like 4th of July for veterans is a nightmare for most veterans. Um, even if they don't have like strong PTSD issues and things, the the, the conditioning issues of the, the explosions and things um, are still present. And so if you can remove that conditioning or reduce the effects of that conditioning, uh, it's a big help. Okay. Um, health responses. Uh, so one of the examples the book gives are going to be like uh, drug cravings, right? I can I can I can condition you to not want the drugs anymore. So essentially, the drug responses to some extent are operant conditioning. Um, but if I can connect that sensation with a really bad feeling, right? Which is actually some of the things that they do um, to to certain certain kinds of drugs um, when they're when they're trying to help people get off of them, they'll give them a substance that basically creates that if if they take a, the drug that they're trying to break the habit of, um, they become violently ill. And then they begin to associate that violent illness with the drug, and it makes it more likely that they won't want to do the drug. There are some people who just push right through and keep doing it, but it's something that can be can can work. Uh, food cravings is another one. Uh, classical conditioning makes dieting difficult, right? We, we learn to associate certain foods with, with certain feelings and pleasant pleasantness. Um, sugar, for example, is a, is a big one, right? It, it, it makes our brain fire off and really happy things. And so therefore, um, we can get very addicted basically to sugar. Uh, but through conditioning, they, they figured out ways, um, to reduce that essentially like I'll, I'll give you some sugar and I'll make you not feel good. And then you start to avoid sweet flavors, um, which could be good, could be bad, depending on, but I, if, if, if it's like really a health issue, that can be a big thing. Immune response is another one. Um, I can I can I can give you a a medicine that has a very strong taste. Think of like cherry cough syrup. Super strong taste, right? If you taste cherry cough syrup and you're ill, it will create a similar response. So if you taste just that weird medicinal cherry flavor, uh, it'll create a similar. Your body will react in a similar way as if you actually took the medicine. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason why medicines 
oftentimes will have a very strong taste. Uh, there's also the thing that a lot of medicines just have a very strong taste on their own and they're trying to cover it. And that nasty cherry flavor is one of those flavors that actually covers it decently. The other one is bubble gum. I hate both of those flavors. They're gross. Grape is not one of my favorites either. But, uh, but anyway, that's the, the goal there is to basically associate that flavor with the with your body. Your body's supposed to respond to it. And then uh, the, just the flavor alone can give you a reaction, um, hopefully positive in this case, right? But the, that's the kind of the thinking. You're, you're getting both the medicinal benefits as well as the psychological benefits from the conditioning. Um, you can help with psychological disorders. Um, again, things like PTSD. If you have different phobias, uh, oftentimes they are, there's connection with classical conditioning to them. Um, one example, let me actually pull over. I got some notes here. Boop, boop, boop. Um, one example of that would be like, uh, oh shoot, where is it in my notes? Like a fear of dogs. Okay. Uh, as a child, you know, you, 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 at some point, let's say a dog like really frightened you badly. Okay. Past a particular house, dog in the yard just like barks loudly and, and it scares you. Okay, and it comes rounding out the fence and like you know slams against the fence and things like that. Um, that frightening experience, that fear response to that dog, it can become a classically conditioned. Um, basically, you, you you learn to respond with fear anytime you see a dog because of those experiences you had as a child, for example. So with with that kind of a thing, we can actually use this behavioristic tendency, this 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 conditioned behavior, um, and expose you to things to reduce the effects to it. Okay. And that's where the therapy also comes in. Um, addicts are counseled to avoid stimuli, for example, people and settings that may trigger cravings, right? A lot of times alcoholics, for example, there's specific areas that they get drunk. So if you can avoid those areas or avoid the people that you usually drink with, you can you can pretty quickly break the habit. I had a couple of friends in college that we pretty much every time we got together, we got drunk. Um, it started becoming a little bit of an issue, right? It wasn't, I wasn't doing it for a very long time, but I started recognizing that I was like, man, we're drinking way more than we should. Um, I, I had to break those friendships off in order to basically make sure I didn't end up becoming an alcoholic. Um, and so that would be, you know, avoid the situation and you're less likely to, to, to fall into that situation. Um, I have a cousin who actually struggled with drug addiction for a number of years and, uh, when he, he ended up in prison at one point where he continued to get drugs, um, when he got out, he wanted to quit. And in order to do that, he actually had to move out of the state to completely break his, break his the, the environment that he was in uh, and get away from the people that were around him that were causing him to keep on falling back into that addiction. Okay. Uh, apparently, a particular taste with a drug that influences immune response may eventually lead to immune response from the taste alone, for example. Okay. Third random fact, the largest unbroken alliance in the world history is between England and Portugal. It's lasted since 1386 and still stands today. Um, that's an old one. Okay, last slide. Applications of class conditioning, part two. Pavlov's work provided a basis for Watson's ideas that human emotions and behaviors, though biologically influenced, are mainly a bundle of conditioned responses. Um, this is really, again, this is what pushed behaviorism forward with this idea. So they would say that, you know, you think you have choices or you think that you have preferences and things, but in reality, it's just been conditioned into you to like those things, right? So if I gave you an op a choice, according to them, if I gave you a choice between a strawberry and a chocolate ice cream, uh, let's say you chose the strawberry and you'd say, I'd say, why do you choose the strawberry? Not because it's my favorite. Okay. Um, behaviors would say the reason it's your favorite is because you have associations with the strawberry ice cream that are more positive than with the chocolate. Okay. Um, so it's more, it's biologically driven that then turns into psychology. Watson applied classical conditioning principles in his studies of the little Albert to demonstrate how specific fears might be conditioned. I don't know if we talked about little Albert. I'm going to touch on it real quick again though, and I'll see if I can find a video on it. Um, little Albert was a kind of a terrible experiment. Actually, it was a small boy. Um, they, they, they brought him into the lab. Um, and at the time when he first came in, he was not afraid of, of any, thing, I, think I probably talked about this one, with the rats. Um, so little Albert had, they gave him a white, a white rat. And at first he wasn't afraid of it. He would reach out for it. Uh, every time he reached out, they would drop a, a large bar on the floor that made a very loud sound and it scared him. And then he very quickly was conditioned to be afraid of the little white rat. Every time the rat would come close, he would be just bursting into tears. 
Um, they brought him in a couple months later to see if, if, if he was still conditioned. He was, in fact, still conditioned to be afraid of white rats. And in fact, he had, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not only, he had generalized. So basically, he, he uh, not only was he afraid of white rats, but he was afraid of all white, fluffy, small things. Um, so there was a bunny that they brought in, a stuffed animal, a lady's puffy white handbag. All of those things uh, caused a fear response in little Albert. We don't actually know what ended up happening to little Albert as far as, like, was he ever able to be unconditioned? They lost track of him pretty soon after the second time they brought him in. Um, and it turns out that he actually passed away when he was a small boy. Uh, he got sick and, and passed away. So that's kind of a sad, sad end of the story. But that conditioning, that what we learned from that terrible experiment that they wouldn't be allowed to do nowadays, um, was that you could condition fear. But the other thing that we learned is that you could uncondition fear uh, from further experiments after that one. Okay. So Watson boasted that he could take any healthy infant and train the child for any career specialization, regardless of any inborn traits, but later admitted to going beyond his facts. Uh, basically, this is the issue where they, they really uh, fell short, primarily due to the fact that they, they, they were overconfident and then they underestimated the complexity of what it was to be a human. Uh, Sadly, Watson's children actually suffered from this. He, he, one of his ch children, they, they suffered from things like drug addiction, and uh, one of his children committed suicide. Um, so when, when Watson passed away, he actually felt like he was a complete failure uh, when it was all said and done. He, he burnt a lot of his work because he, he felt like, you know, he, essentially all of his work was for naught because he, he failed in his own life and in his family. Sad, kind of a sad ending, kind of a sad bummer note on this one. Last random fact. This is actually possibly due to the conditioning. Okay, after the release of the 1996 film Scream, so in, in the movie Scream, there's an anonymous killer who uh, calls his, his victims before he murders them, and then he goes and murders them. Um, right after that movie came out, caller ID tripled in the United States. <laughs> The use of caller ID. Everyone was like, I need to know who's calling me. Like, um, So yeah, movies can have effects on society. Anyway, um, and that's the last fact. So there we go. Four facts, a bunch of information about classical conditioning. If you have questions, message me. Don't forget to do the quizzes. Um, and yeah, on the next video, we'll be looking at operative conditioning uh, more in depth and kind of how, how that works in... Uh, and how we learn things. So uh, until then, have a great day. Have a great time, whatever it is. If you're watching the next video right after this, good luck. But anyway, have a great one. And I will see you all in the next video.